Hi, welcome to our torque calibration part two webinar, the importance of torque control, wrenches, and use. My name is Henry Zumbra. I'm the president of Morehouse Instrument Company, and I'm pleased to present this second part of our torque series with, with you. We have been asked several times to do webinars on torque, and so we did part one, and now part two is about wrenches and a lot of how to handle wrenches and a lot of things comparing uh, digital to analog wrenches. And I've been very fortunate in this part that I've been able to work with some great people along the way, Clint Clusel from Boeing, David Devon from um, Digital Solutions, David Wan from uh, Stallville, and all of that, and uh, many more, Craig uh, Brody from Norbar, and many other people along the way to help with the wrench part of this discussion, which I'm gonna convey uh, a lot of that information uh, to you. And it's, some of that also is ATK, uh, fortunate to work with a group out at ATK as well. Um, so anyway, if you'd like to get in touch with me, there's my email address and everything else. Our purpose at Morehouse is we create a safer world by helping companies improve their force and torque measurements. This session specifically went over some of it is to understand the purpose of a threaded fastener and then understand the different types of wrenches and how to use them. And maybe some wrenches that you may wanna avoid. Uh, let's start with the importance of torque control. And that is basically, how is this determined? Right, you have a connection, a joint, which made up of different pieces which are attached and held together. The device or the fastener which holds the pieces together must be designed to be stronger than the total of all loads incurred, including operation and environmental factors. The tightening of the fastener creates a clamping force, and that fastener is dimensioned and preloaded so that forces acting to separate the connection are overcome. You look at this today versus some you know, past versus future, traditional fastener, here we're metric M18 5x6, versus a modern fastener, M10 uh, to 10.9. And the modern fasteners, look, reduced head size util utilizing an inner profile to application, reduced head size equals less surface contact, therefore the materials being fastened are also high strength, low weight, reduced faster diameter, but increased thread pitch. The final torque value of all of this was, was always, in the past, was always dependent on the sensitivity and skill of the installer. Fasteners were often inconsistent in material, hardness and even form, and results in inconsistencies in actual loading and load carry abilities basically led engineers to over-design things and often led things to either be you know, too loose or too tight. And if it's too tight, it would result in damage or breaking the fast fastener. So, and then the connections which were critical uh, in nature were there for like over-engineered. If I had a critical application, the engineer would just say, okay, I'm gonna call for a larger fastener because we don't or cannot control it uh, as well. As we progress and learn more about torque and we get better with some digital wrenches and some other things, our measurements get better. Now we can have more confidence to use less material. And if you think about this uh, overall, an M18 on every, if you start looking at the material used, it's quite a bit. If I know my measurement, I can use a lot less and lighter material versus if I do not know my measurement. So overall importance of torque control, threaded faster is to clamp parts together with a tension greater than external forces tending to separate them. When a bolt is torqued properly, it remains under constant stress and is immune from fatigue. In order to reach the desired torque value, enough force must be applied and to overcome the friction induced by turning the faster against the components, nut thread, spring, washer, and materials being attached and clamped. To load the fastener materials being connected to the value inside their elastic limits. Um, and worn fasteners can produce several issues, uh, just things that you should be aware of overall. If we get everything right, we're going to be within this zone, right? Where we're not, where we have not deformed anything. We're gonna be able to load our fastener, hopefully we load it to the, the proper range and do not exceed it. But if we ex exceed it, maybe we do an extra click on a wrench, get 10% over or whatnot. We, as long as we're in that elastic range, it's reversible. If we overclick, oh, 
Uga Duga number three, like one click, two click, three clicks, and maybe we're applying a lot more than that 10, 20 percent. Maybe we're at 30, 40 percent. Then we might get permanent deformation of the faster. We might not know we've done it. And then if we go too far, we get failure or breakage. So I like this a lot better, this, this graph and representation, because this is where we want. We want our target in this nominal zone, this elastic zone. And the amount of torque applied should not exceed the amount that will stretch the bolt beyond the elastic region. Staying within this region means if we are to loosen the bolt, it will return to its original length. This is a region that engineers target when specifying installation of torque values. If we stretch that bolt beyond it, it begins to go permanently deformed. That's we get into here, this plastic region, right? And then if we loosen the bolt, it will not return to its original length. Therefore, we have a bolt that needs to be thrown out likely, but it will have been permanently stretched. And even though it may not be visible, the bolt has been weakened. We do not want to put weakened bolts in things. Right here, the importance of torque control. If torque's not applied properly and the tension on the bolt uh, is too low, varying loads will act upon the bolt and it will fail. Here's a picture that's getting ready to come loose in an H2O pulley bolt, which then leads us right into some recalls. Honda recalls 50,000 vehicles. And what's, why? Right there, right? The ministry said the bolts may come loose in tension, causing the drive belt, which runs the alternator and the water pump to circulate coolant water to come off the pulley. RAV4. Recall, Toyota, 778,000 vehicles. Toyota said that if the nuts on the rear suspension arms of these vehicles aren't tightened in properly during a wheel alignment service, the arms may come loose or separate. If you watch close, this is not the greatest uh, to, to stream these videos, but if we watch this close, right there in this video, comes right off, comes right off. So what if we over tighten? If the tension is too high, the tightening process may cause bolt failure. There's a uh, dragster racer and the bolts on the left exhaust manifold were over torqued, right? Plastically deformed and, and then guess what? They fail. Manifolds pops off and 4,000 bhp of exhaust gas launches the car in air at over 200 miles per hour. Probably a car you do not want to be in. Another thing, we you know we we know torque control for lots of different different applications, and this one was just an interesting one about e ASTM E2624, which is standard practice for torque calibration of testing machines and devices. Here's a four by four being uh, tested and, and broken. The calibration standard, which the torsion cells would be calibrated to per our last session would be ASTM E2428. That would be used to calibrate the testing machine in accordance with 2624. So just imagine this, if one of the 150 plus car engine bolts is under torqued in one of your cars, what happens? It loosens over time and eventually destroys the engine. What if bolts are under torqued in an airplane assembly and become loose mid flight? We've had that, right? We've had it on doors. We've saw it, we've seen it recently. Uh, the, the cause was under torquing the exit door, right? And it flew off. So it's really important that for everything that we do, that fastener reliability depends on controlling the tightening torque and torque is everywhere. You change your tire. Right, my son had an issue where they they likely over torque things and it broke on the highway and his his wheel comes flying off. That wheel could fly into another car. So we have an article on that uh, online if you have any interest in reading it. But if we look at some of the numbers of reported torque issues, fasteners undone or incomplete accounts for about 22% of the issues. So items left loose or disconnected, about 10%. Lack of lubrication, if you need it, 
caps loose are missing about 11 percent so really it's it's by far fasteners undone uh or incomplete is is our biggest problem overall with torque and that leads to something people know me i'm a pretty much like to go by the definitions and the definitions say that torque is force times length it is not foot pound Somehow, foot-pound is a unit of work or energy in the engineering gravitational systems in the United States customary and imperial units of measure. People use this. We see it all the time. We say foot-pound and newton-meter. No one says meter newton. The proper ter terminology should be LBF foot or a pound foot, which is a unit of torque or moment of force, a pseudo vector. One pound foot is the torque created by one pound force acting at a perpendicular distance of one foot from a pivot point. Torque is derived from length, mass, and time. And then you have it here. The meter is the SI base unit of length, kilogram of torque. We have Planck's constant now. The second uh, is the SI base unit of torque. So that leads us into torque wrenches and applications. A torque wrench is a tool used to precisely apply a specific torque to a fastener, such as a nut or bolt. It usually comes in the form of a socket wrench with special internal mechanisms. Pretty standard. It was invented by Conrad Barr in 1918 while working for the New York City Water Department and was designed to prevent over-tightening of bolts on water main and steam pipe repairs underground. Today, uh, industries rate standards and, and require the use of torque for component assemblies and maintenance. The application of proper torque to fasteners must be applied using tools that meet industry specifications and standards. Well, what does that mean? Right? We do have some standards. We're, there's there's some out there. ASME has uh, some torque standards. ISO has some torque standards, and we'll cover some of it. And if we're going to understand torque, one of the things that that is interesting is Hooke's law. And it's the force required to stretch an elastic object, such as a metal spring, which is directly proportional to the extension of the spring. And it's commonly written there. And you can see it takes twice as much force to stretch the spring uh, twice as far. And it means if one pound were placed on a spring and the spring deflected one inch, then the spring would deflect two inches if two pound load were placed upon it. The spring would continue to deflect one inch for each additional pound until the stress of the spring reached the elastic limit of the steel. When that limit is exceeded, the spring will take a permanent set and not return to its original shape when the load is removed. When the spring is used in rotational systems, e.g. E e torsion spring, Hooke's law can be adapted to a, a described relationship. So if you want some more history on it, you can look at Hooke's law relation to torque. You look more stuff up. You can find a lot of formulas and how that's derived. But in pretty simplistic terms you know we look at this diagram we look at this this uh, wrench here and the above diagram illustrates a torque wrench the distance between the center line and drive uh square to the center line of force being applied to the handle is the lever length of the torque wrench it's designated there as l the arrow pointing downward at the handle of the torque wrench represents a force or pull which is exerted by the operator and that's right there we want to pull down to apply the torque the curved arrow about the drive is torque at rivers is the torque at which being applied to the nut or the cap screw. You know, this is also the torque that's indicated on the scale as TW. There's one precaution that must be observed on all of this in using the formula. The lever length must be measured at 90 degrees from the direction of the force. That's shown there. And torque is calculated by using the formula length times force. There's a right way to use this device and a wrong way. Right way, hand the center point, hand both times the center point. Wrong way is you're shifted off towards the indicator and you're shifted away from. Now you're not on the center line. So very important for the use of a skilled operator and these things move to keep them balanced uh, on this type of wrench. Another type of wrench, and just a simple example is, you know, length times, there we have, uh, uh, you know, the example here is we have a two foot um, from square drive to center handle with 50 pounds of force. 
So in that situation, we have 50 pounds of force times two feet and 90 degree angle, we have 100 pounds per foot of torque. What we wanna be careful not to do is use an extension or pipe on the handle to apply the torque, because now we're not on that center line. If we wanted to use our torque wrench, good proper use is to use a smooth, even pull to stop the to the stopping point. Jerking the wrench can cause the pivot point to break early. Not stopping when the wrench clicks will cause cause it to over torque. This is where I personally have some issues because it's with the click type wrenches. It's like, did I get the torque? You listen, listen, and then it clicks and then you don't let go. You might apply more torque. You might have it click twice, um, which obviously is going to have additional torque to it uh, overall, maybe 10 percent, maybe a lot more than that, depending on where and what you do. The other thing about torque control is the bolt pattern. Here is just showing a 75 per, torque everything to about 75 percent and then go in and torque everything to 100 percent. And when more than one bolt holds the surface together, there is normally a sequence, you know, a crisscross, a star pattern. Um, Sometimes the maintenance manual will have a numbering scheme like one and then two and whatnot. Uh, just starting on one side and circling around is what you want to avoid. So with this, with this, oops, I wanted to draw on that one. With this, you might go 75% to here, to there, to there. And then you come in and you go there, to here, to here. And that's all we're saying. So it's, you know, one, two, three, four. In some cases, the maintenance manual will require threads to be lubricated prior to tightening the bolt. Be careful with this, right? Whether lubricant is used or not has considerable impact on how much torque is required to reach a given preload. Use lubricant if required or not if so specified. If you do not follow the point, you've wasted your time using a torque wrench. Using the law, wrong lubrication or grease can result in a 30 to 50% error. Do not exceed the recommended working range of the torque wrench. Reliable measurements are based on a percentage of the working range. In general, most mechanical wrenches have a utilizable range from 20% to 100% of full scale, and most of the digital wrenches have a usable range from 10% 10, 10 to 100%. Always store a torque wrench in a protective case and or location when not in use. If you're using a click type wrench, always sort at the lowest level on the scale. Do not go past the lowest point on the scale as the spring strength will not be maintained. Avoid dropping or sliding a torque wrench. Dropping a torque wrench on a hard surface can cause the instrument to lose reliable calibration. Using a torque wrench for a purpose it was not intended for will, may also damage and void the calibration. If you suspect that a wrench has been dropped or misused, have the tool inspected by the manufacturer or reputable calibration service. When we were on the Metrology Today podcast in Texas, we were, you know, people were using clamps to tighten bolts, right? Micrometers to tighten bolts. Absolutely silly. There's examples, and these were examples that were given during that discussion, and other things. They were saying, yeah, they use torque wrenches, hammers, use a torque wrench to do this, that. So we have several different types of torque wrenches. This is one uh, from Stallville. Uh, we have an indicated, uh, which is known as a type one per ISO 6789. It can be a deflection dial, electronic indication. Click is a type two. Um, angle is a type one. Uh, you have a hybrid, uh, which is an electromechanical, like an all type wrench. The hybrid one is really good uh, in this one. Uh, I'm fortunate to use these in digital wrenches and I'm very happy with those. Do all torque wrenches work the same way? No. You have things slip as a slip clutch where you have integral protection against overload, whereas a disadvantage would be sudden release can be dangerous at higher values. Not common above 10 newton meters due to health and safety concerns. You have a knuckle joint type, advantage acceptable trigger signal, Disadvantage, multiple friction zones, rapid change in trigger values, reduced repeatability, sensitive to change in speed of usage. You have a trigger cam, readily detectable trigger by feel and sound, with a disadvantage of high wear potential on cam and pivot. 
superior materials and manufacturing tolerance is required. So guess what? Not many people make them this way. Trigger block, which we have the probably the most common, low cost and simple to manufacture. Disadvantage barely to detectable trigger at lower set values. So influences, if I want to make a better, you know, accurate, um, I want to be better with my measurements, you know, uh, overall, I want to select the right met wrench. Operator error, I want to train my operators, right? Speed and variation of how they're applying it. Hand placement, like I said, if they grip too close or too far away, depending on the type of wrench. Twist and alignment influences. Then you get things like ratchet versus fixed drives, digital versus analog. Analog. The other thing we want to look at is these that not all wrenches are good, right? You buy a cheap wrench, sometimes they have things called back torque. You have all this energy in the system that you're applying, and when it releases, what happens to that energy? If you're going in a clockwise fashion and you have all this tension and energy built up and that releases, where does it go? Well, the concept that it actually goes back to the fastener is called back torque. And certain types of wrenches exhibit this. In some cases, the back torque can produce torque in the opposing direction to actually loosen the bolt. ATK was fortunate enough that they shared a lot of this with me. Um, and then we're going to do a little bit of a bridge so people know about it, right? There's some basic types, click type driver handle, click type ratcheting wrench, pneumatic torque wrench, electronic torque wrench. But if we look at this, what AK, ATK did, which is kind of really cool, and you can do this. If you compared wrenches, right, you line everything up. So what they're doing here is they basically have a known value that they want to get to. Well, relatively known value. We never know the true value. but they they want to get there. They put these lines, and this is where things should line up. Now, if we watch the video, you'll see, and you'll and you'll actually might be able to see this back torque. Okay, so now everything on there. If you watched it, you could see everything lined up, and it snapped. And then after it snapped it went back and ATK basically said, okay, let's look at this. Let's, why is this happening? And ratcheting mechanism is a cog assembly and the release and control by spring loaded roller assembly. The set point is adjusted by compressing a stiff spring. When the torque load creates a force exceeding the spring force, the roller assembly climbs over the cog. As the roller comes off the backside of the cog, it naturally creates a rebounding load on the fastener. When a set point of the compression spring is overcome, the roller assembly climbs over the cog and creates a load component in the direction of the torque being applied. And then as the roller assembly comes off the backside of the cog, it naturally creates a kickback load in the reverse direction of the torque being applied. So the cog assembly just naturally in this design has a kickback torque component. It's going to happen. The pole is the primary working component in a click type torque mechanism, and that's right here if we're looking at for that we have all these things that go into it so let's look at another clicker right let's look at dts uh this is digital's uh solution they make great stuff uh, out in california the, the location but here we have a dts clicker what's going on the square drive you have top view uh and you have your click and this is an adjustable click wrench if we look at some pros and cons of the click type wrenches we have provide consistent results as a pro which i'll show later in uh, some of our pt uh, data they reduce operator error uh, reading and interpreting scale get the right wrench from the kit and use it independent verification is rarely needed and then the the big con as i was saying earlier is there's a tendency to over torque a faster did it click did i do something right and did i go past the click human me as a human usually cannot react quick enough when the click mechanism is tripped. And here we have some software that's kind of cool. It's showing, hey, I want to hit 150 pound feet. And actually when we measure it, it's 160. So we're 10 over. But what ATK did here was interesting because they looked at the these uh, traces and you can see that 10 pound inch of applied 
look, so 10 pound inch of applied right here. And then after that happened, look, about three went in this region, a quarter, about three pound inch came off of it. And then here was counterclockwise, about the same thing. So in both directions, we're seeing about 30%, 25 to 30% of the torque coming off. Single direct ratcheting wrench, here we have 20 pound feet being applied and four pounds coming off. What, what this essentially means is my target for the fastener, engineers calculate out that I need 20 pound feet. And in actuality, I'm only tightening that bolt to 16. Is that a situation where it's gonna come loose over time? Likely. So, and then here's, here's another uh, really 16 Newton meter when three came back off the trace. So it's the inherent design and people might be watching this saying, well, what can we do about this inherent design fall? Well, you can look for it. You can ask people, hey, does your wrench have back torque? They'll probably look at you like you're crazy. Though some manufacturers actually acknowledge it. And right here, this IFR model, are impact free when the cam resets. So that's the term that you're gonna look for, impact free. I have this cam, it's going to reset, it's probably going to produce all that energy going backwards. I wanna make sure that whoever's manufacturer I'm buying wrenches from, uh, torque wrenches from, do not do that because I want to apply the proper force. In the ATK situation, when they discovered it, they had records of everything and they got rid of the bad stuff and they had to go torque back down. Like they spent like a million dollars torquing everything back down. Really good stuff. I mean, they make missile systems. They make, you know, we don't want these loose screws or loose fasteners to come loose when we fire a missile, it's probably not going to hit the target. So very critical application. Um, so let's look at, I said uh, we had the privilege uh, to work with different wrench manufacturers. This one was we set up through NCSLI, the airline committee. We set up a, a controlled PT where we set a wrench. Uh, we had a TTP Pro, uh, we had a click wrench, we had a digital wrench, and we went through, I was one of the techs, we had other techs, we, we did all these tests with them, and we basically said, what's better, the click type or the digital? And starting to look at some of the data, this was just, we took the average and the deviations from average, and we looked at the CMCs, the calibration and measure, measurement capabilities, so that's my uncertainty component. I calculated it out using the five R's, the E. I did not get long-term stability. We got kind of short-term stability in this measurement, um, just for your information. And if we look at like, okay, the click type, how good did we get? Well, we got to at 200 pound feet, we got to four. Down here on the digital, we got to 2.24. What's interesting is this one digital wrench is supposedly four times better than the click type wrench. Looking at the data, it's definitely different. And the maximum difference overall are, are between operators was quite good, right? On here, if we're looking at numbers, and this is where people like to make up numbers and everything else. So if we start looking at all of them, at 50 pound feet, what, two to one? At 100? more than two to one. I look at 150, the difference uh, here, 5.9 versus 0 0.07. We could say it's, oh, we are like 80, what if they like 90 plus times better. Um, it's just a lot, right? If If you look at the total number, we would say, hey, we're 84.2 what times better. That's that's insane. Uh, but then we go back to 200. It's just how the numbers came about. Then we go back to 200. And in 200, almost four times better. So it, uh, it was different uh, to see these uh, two wrenches. And it definitely started leading to, like, if I'm controlling this, I, the digital wrenches uh, obviously uh, perform a bit better. Click type wrench on a TTP uh, transducer. So that's what we sent around for this PT, which was interesting. So we calibrated this TTP transducer in our NPL machine, which is the second most accurate torque machine in the world. And then we had people do it on their different benches. So on their own bench and looking at the numbers. And numbers look pretty good, right? Overall, there's, there's 
quite a bit of variation in in these points the 50 100 150 250 you can see that this this one right here is really nice and nominal though not many were hitting where they needed to hit and then here's the torque wrench calibrator and the digital wrench on the ttp transducer and if we look at this these numbers look at them look how much better look at the agreement on all of these the ttb transducer had some additional error you had you had something going on there but overall you're looking at about what plus or minus two and a half versus if we go back over here we were five five and a half or more right or seven and a half on this graph seven and a half so seven and a half versus two and a half about if we wanted to look at it let's do let's put this on just text click type wrenches what was the average we took you know different text from different locations and on average with a click type wrench repeatability was what around one percent we look at all these averages here you can see around one percent and if we look at the digital type wrench much better sometimes six times better sometimes not quite twice as good though if we look at just the overall repeatability besides this one tech that's right here tech number four bit of an outlier here uh, i think that skewed a lot of the some of these skewed some of the data though look at look at the overall repeatability tech one they were 1.3 versus 0.73 they were 0.35 versus 0.1 uh, there's tech 3.8926 in all cases except for this tech 4 case the 200 the way that numbers came down uh, the digital rents exceeded and if we look at the actual data so we take the ttp pro comparing this is what we could control we know we have a good cow in this ttp pro that we sent out with the wrenches different technicians at the 200 pound force point on the click wrench and looking at this data we have a p-value of 0.06 and we have an f critical and an f calculated and the f calculated is less than the f critical so what's what does this mean with the p-value and everything else it basically means there's not enough evidence to suggest that the variances or means are different and repeatability is the square root of the variance so that's what we're calling repeatability and reproducibility is the standard deviation of the average and if we look at this number doing an ANOVA analysis which is an analysis of variance you can do it in Excel with the with the tool pack there is a likelihood that there's no statistical difference between operators so let's look at this overall 0.851 and 2.352 okay let's look at the digital now much different numbers our reproducibility numbers are much much better 0.736 our repeatability numbers are 0.6682 versus 851 so percentage wise let's look at if we look at more of these numbers f calculated is now much greater than f critical and the p value is nowhere near 0.05 percent nowhere near so the likelihood of repeating this test is low there's definitely a difference between operators and this is where my good friend Greg Senker wrote a paper for Quality Magazine that seek I, I seek out and start looking at the integrity of our data. Is this data good? Well, we look at this data and we say, okay, look at the text. Look, look at tech, tech two. Tech two looks really good. Tech three, eh, one one pound difference. Tech four, three pound, like almost a four pound different and then you have tech one at what uh like a 2.6 pound difference so depending on the tech this tech two really did a a, a really nice job here as uh, you know all the numbers were good and tech three tech three looked good as well but what 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 does this tell us the digital wrench is more repeatable and the reproducibility standard deviation of the average is about three times better the F calculated being higher than the F critical means that there's no statistical sensitive that the evidence that's a group of means are different and the observed variation is greater than expected by chance, indicating a significant effect. It's better. So now we might be looking at, let's train our technicians. 
let's really go and put more effort if we want to nail this down and get a lot better. On this side of things, going back to the analog wrench, look, we six pound feet off the average on that one, right? Some of these groupings, there's eight pounds. Tech one, not looking too good. Tech two did a really good, nice job there, standard deviation 0.7. And uh, tech three, one point seven, tech four. So there's a lot to be said for training technicians in this series. These were supposedly trained technicians that went to, I mean, the people in the airline committee were, were very good labs where they had trained technicians. So maybe it is a technician problem. The point is that ANOVA, analysis of variance, is a great tool. And the other point is that it seems to show that the digital wrenches really do outperform if just looking at numbers 1.47 versus 4.7 on the re reproducibility so if we want lower uncertainties we're probably going to go with a digital wrench but we still need to work on our technique and technicians frequently asked questions i need 775 pound feet which wrench do i need okay so generally use a middle portion of a wrench, so 150 pound foot wrench is recommended. And I use my 250 pound foot wrench uh, set at 25 pound feet. And I remember this is click wrenches, so with digital wrenches, we might have a different answer, but most mechanical wrenches can only be used from 20% to 100%, digital wrenches are 10%. So if you had a digital wrench, you might be able to do it. You should be able to do it. What length of cheater bar do I need to get to 300 pound feet from a 250 pound wrench? Hopefully everybody knows this answer, which is first, never use a cheater bar. Second, never exceed the maximum torque value of a wrench. Third, never use a cheater bar, right? It's just not appropriate. It's not something we want to be doing or using. Buy the appropriate wrench. Okay. So now we're electronic and mechanical torque tools, micrometer adjust click wrenches. Here's some more questions on the most common wrench. We think, how often should I have my wrench calibrated? Recommendation, this is uh, Digital, this is Norbar, this is almost everybody else I've seen. Uh, there probably are some exceptions if you go looking. 5,000 cycles or once a year. Is it okay to leave my adjustable wrench wound up during storage? Ha ha, no, on a wrench part, do not do that. Always unwind the wrench to the lowest mark. Don't rewind, don't unwind it to zero. Um, look at the instructions of the wrench because if most of them will say, if it's store it at the lowest point, uh, lowest mark before storage, and it's usually not zero. My ratchet head is broken. Do I need to recalibrate if I repair the head? No, repairing a ratchet has to not affect the cal typically does not affect the calibration. That is from digital. There might be some that do. I don't know. As I said, I'm fortunate to work with, uh, be able to work with and help present with all the people that have made a living making torque wrenches or using torque wrenches. Morehouse, what we do is we like to help industry back to the purpose of statement of of you know, creating a safer world for force and torque is basically we want to educate. So if I had all this knowledge that was given to me and presented, fortunate to present with uh, other people, I want to share it, right? We're not experts. We do not calibrate wrenches. I've dabbled in wrenches uh, for the most part. We calibrate the standards, the transducers that are used to calibrate other transducers. We calibrate the torque uh, standards that are used to calibrate the wrenches but we don't do the wrench calibration so i don't have experience of doing 3000 4000 pallets of wrenches that some people out there might have and if you have that that's very invaluable uh information that that just cannot be replaced from you know hanging out with other people that that do this and have all the techniques and everything else all i have is like some proficiency data that shows that the digital wrenches uh based on the the demographic that we sent to were were much better from digital than a click type and we have that information for atk showing that back torque definitely does exist so things you can do 
uh, if you want to create your home garage, I say this is my my garage. It's really not. Uh, hopefully, what we've learned is that torque is more complicated than just a force uh, times length. Here we have our, if you see this, here we have our length measurement. If those have paid attention, if we wanted to do this properly, that bag should be centered and not inched up on this. I found this online. So it's much more complicated. We got to get the positioning. We got to get everything else right. And people fail to do that. And when they fail to do that, we either have fasteners that are over overly tightened or not tight enough. And each situation is is bad. Uh, the under tightened fasteners, at least you can go back and you know you haven't you know deformed the the fastener where you can apply the proper torque, as such that ATK did with the uh, with the, the missiles and, and whatnot. When, if you over torque things, uh, now you just probably need to throw the bolt away. Hope you found this useful. Hopefully there's some takeaways. You can show maybe a new technician on some wrench uh, handling and some things to do. As they learn, they're probably going to far exceed what I have taught you today. We have Morehouse Mastery Series, which is about 40 weeks of emails, each about 10 minutes, three times a week, Tuesday through Thursday, 10 minutes a day, which gets the participant about 20 hours of reading. There's reading, there's videos, there's some assignments, there's a quiz um, in, in the whole uh, section. There's some torque information, some call here information, lots of stuff, force information. This is free. It just comes from email three times a week. If you're interested, just go to our website, go to training, and sign up for the free metrology professional development. Uh, if you would be so kind to go like us, follow us on YouTube, follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, know that we have free downloads if you want them. We have uh, understanding load cell specification guides. We have all kinds of other things out there for you to read that are all free. And hopefully some of the information that we know we can share with you and you can benefit from. There's no chance, there's no reason to have to reinvent the wheel on almost anything. So you just go to this documentation and tools section of our website. Let me move my go to meeting. Uh, and there's load cell specification guidance. It's the same, it's very similar for Torque. So if you wanted to know, uh, our one of our engineers, Mark Jones and I wrote it. So if you wanna know about what things are, what's SEB mean on a torsion cell? Well, this explains it. There's lots of other documents there. Uh, there's calculations, you want to know that. Decision rules, you want to know that. Uh, interval, uh, reliability for a uh, year cal. Want to know about, you know, uh, doing CMCs, calibration measurement capability. Here's uncertainty worksheets in Excel uh, with guidance. The guidance part of this has instructions uh, for, for that. So please check out our website. Follow us on LinkedIn. When we get when we put up new guidance or new training offerings or whatever, uh, you know, we really want to educate everybody, help educate everybody, share whatever information we know with the community, get better, uh, all get better together. So thank you for your time. It is important. Thank you for listening to me, whether it's on YouTube or live. And hopefully there was some takeaways with this presentation. I cannot thank you enough for your time and hopefully your continued support for Morehouse. Thank you.